in 1785. Several children in the township of Blair, Maryland, accused Ellie Kedward of witchcraft. She was found guilty and banished in the middle of winter. It was assumed she died from exposure. The following year, all of her accusers and half the town's children had vanished. Fearing a curse, the entire township fled as soon as the weather broke and vowed never to utter the name Ellie Kedward again. Hello, my name is Michael and I obsess. I come across something that grabs me and I consume until I can't take anymore and then I'm on to the next. Some obsessions last a week, others a lifetime. It is my intention to explore these obsessions with you as they occur while the passion is hot. Welcome to Eclectic Obsessions. My main regret regarding this is that I didn't know of it until long after the fact. While I saw the feature in the theater, I had missed out on all the precursing hype and didn't see this until the VHS release of the movie. We will be exploring Curse of the Blair Witch on this episode of Eclectic Obsessions. Curse of the Blair Witch is a pseudo-documentary with accompanying website about the Blair Witch legend and the three filmmakers who disappeared in October of 1994. It first aired on the Sci-Fi Channel July 11, 1999 as a promotional prelude to the release of the Blair Witch Project on July 30, 1999. The Curse of the Blair Witch presents the legend as real, complete with manufactured newspaper articles, newsreels, television news reports, and staged interviews. The elements of the story as told here involve the three Montgomery College film students, Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard, and Michael Williams, who disappear while making a documentary tracing the local lore of the Blair Witch in the woods near Burkittsville, Maryland. Their equipment and footage is discovered a year later. The legend describes the killings and disappearances of some of the residents of Blair, Maryland, a former town on the site of Burkittsville, Maryland, from the 18th to 20th centuries. Residents blame these occurrences on the ghost of Ellie Kedward, a Blair resident accused of practicing witchcraft in 1785 and sentenced to death by exposure. The legend is as follows. In 1630, Colonel Nathaniel Blair led an expedition to find a suitable place to build a fort in Maryland's Black Hills Forest, a place in which, according to local traditions, Native American tribes dared not enter. Nathaniel sought help from a local tribe, but they sabotaged his expedition. In spite of this, Blair and his men built the fort, which they baptized with the colonel's surname. Over the years, the site would grow to become the city of Blair in 1634. Burkittsville was actually founded on another old sound town by the name of Blair. And it was it was founded here in 1734 to protect the western approaches to Baltimore from attack by the, uh, the Indians and so forth. But it uh, it died out because of a, a witch. In 1785, a Blair resident named Ellie Kedward was accused of practicing witchcraft by several children. The children said that she had dragged them from their homes with the intention of drinking their blood. Ellie Kedward was convicted of witchcraft and exiled from Blair forever. She was tied to a tree and abandoned in the woods during a very harsh winter. From then on, numerous strange happenings began to take place in the forest of Black Hills. In November 1786, half the village's children had disappeared. None of them were ever found. Fearing that these disappearances were due to the existence of a curse, the residents fled Blair and never returned. 
Her name was Ellie Kedwards. And she took a bunch of the children and kidnapped them and carried them off into the woods and they never found them again. And the people became very afraid and they pulled up and left and abandoned the town. And it stayed abandoned for 40 years. Though records from this period of history are scarce, this registry of the seafaring vessel, the Reliant, shows that a woman named Ellie Kedward, the woman history has labeled as the Blair Witch, did in fact sail from Ireland to Baltimore in the summer of 1769. The Blair Witch uh, story uh, begins like all other witch stories and legends uh, with an old haggard lady and in this particular case, she was a Catholic living in a predominantly uh, Protestant community. The story goes that she had bled a few children and by that pinpricks, um, probably because of some sort of illness that she detected or something to that effect. The children went back, reported it to their parents. This is, of course, at that time, an early sign of witchcraft. She was tried, summarily convicted, and banished. The winter she was banished was supposedly the worst ever, and no one knows what happened to her. She was left by herself out in the woods. What they did was they blindfolded her, took her out into the woods, and this was in the middle of the winter, tied her to a tree, and left her, where she soon succumbed to the uh, elements. The following year, the young lady who was her first accuser and most of the other children who were her accusers and children of the village vanished throughout the course of the winter. By the end of the winter, over half the town's children had disappeared. Well, immediately, the townspeople blamed these disappearances on Ellie the Witch. The, the people simply vacated the area. They left. They abandoned the community. And, and they never spoke about the incident again. A book appeared in 1809 called The Blair Witch Cult. This book tells the story of a village cursed by a witch. However, in this story, the witch is hunted and then burned for her crimes. In 1809, a rare book about the occurrences surrounding the Blair Witch legend was discovered, entitled The Blair Witch Cult. This tome is supposedly a collection of first-hand accounts that illustrate the effects of the infamous Blair Witch. And the book is, is filled with uh, bloodletting, uh, all kinds of bloody gore, witchcraft, paganism. Uh, basically, it's a pack of lies. Don't believe any of it. But the people of the, ti uh, of the time did believe in it. But it was about the Blair Witch, and it was pretty true, pretty factual book about what really happened here. But the Maryland Historical decided to want it back, and they took it over, almost over my dead body but I couldn't keep it because it didn't belong to them. Forty years passed before Henry Burkett bought the abandoned town from the government. He rebuilt the buildings and in 1824 he renamed the city Burkittsville. They were building a railroad through here and the gentleman was building a railroad was out riding his horse and got lost, stumbled up on an old road and it led into what was Blair at the time. He had a friend named Burkett and Mr. Burkett was a developer, and he talked him into coming here and uh, developing this here, and he named it Burkittville. The town was actually formed about 1824, and uh, right about a year after that, uh, the crops had come in. The, the wheat was mostly what the farmers grew there, and the crops were in, and they decided to have a picnic down on the local creek. In August 1825, 11 Burkittsville residents claimed that a woman's pale hand emerged from Tappy East Creek and pulled 10-year-old Eileen Treacle underwater. The search for the young girl took weeks, but her body was never found. There was an incident that occurred involving a young child by the name of uh, Eileen Treacle. This little girl was playing in a very shallow stream of water and she drowned. Now, the creek was real shallow. It was only probably six to eight inches deep. A child could just wade across or crawl across there, really. It was so shallow. Well, supposedly, according to the story, there was 12 witnesses who observed a ghostly white hand come up out of the water and drag the child under the water. That's all they could see. Nobody ever saw a face or body. All they remember seeing was the arm and the hand. And before they could get to her, they'd she had went, pulled her down. She'd went under the rocks and the mud, 
and everything was calm again. After that, the people wouldn't even go near the creek. They wouldn't fish in it, they didn't swim in it, they didn't do anything in it because it just scared them completely to death, and they blamed that on the, the Blair Witch. In March 1886, eight-year-old Robin Weaver was reported missing. Rescue teams searched for several days until they found her. The girl said that she had met an old lady in the forest who was not walking, but floating. That lady took her hand and led her to a house where she was left in the basement, with a promise that the old woman would return. Robin waited for a long time, but started to get scared, and she finally fled. She was a little girl. She would, uh, had been walking in the woods one day, and this lady appeared to her. And she wasn't walking, she was floating in the air, really, and took her by the hand and led her to an old house back in the woods, and took her down in the basement and left her there and said she'd be back. And she left. And the little girl sat there, she said, for several hours, and finally she got scared. She ran, was able to crawl through a window and ran back to town. But in the meantime, the town had started to search for her. They sent out a search party to look for her in the woods. But it's plausible here that this little girl was only telling a story uh, of the Blair Witch as, as she heard it from maybe her parents her siblings or her friends. But what is strange about this case was that the first search party that had gone out to look for the little girl had vanished. When the entire search party failed to return, another search party was dispatched to find them. What they found was a massacre. Five other rescue workers found bodies in a place known as Coffin Rock. The corpses were tied together hand and foot and had been disemboweled. The rescuers returned to the village to tell others what they had seen, but when they returned to the location, the bodies were gone. And that search party come up on Coffin Hill or Coffin Rock and uh, found those men. The first search party had been killed, laid out on a flat rock in the woods. They had been disemboweled, and on their faces, their hands and feet, was, were carved these strange uh, pagan symbols. And they were heavily cut in by the rope so they were alive when they were tied up. And uh, somebody had disemboweled every one of them and cut some letters and stuff in their foreheads. And very good, it wasn't crude. You could read whatever was there. It was all symbolic type stuff. Uh, and uh, it scared them very bad and like most it would anybody. Like I, I, I couldn't stood there very long. Their bodies were in a severe state of decom decomposition. Uh, so the search party goes back to get help, and when they return, the bodies have vanished without a trace. But they could still smell death in the air, which uh, you, where men die or women die, that you can always smell smell that. And uh, they were, there was no sign of them there. Between November 1940 and March 1941, eight more children disappeared from the town. Rustin Parr was a serial killer from the 1940s who was found guilty of murdering seven children in Burkittsville, Maryland, on the supposed instructions of the Blair Witch. Now, if you notice there's been an interval of about 60 years in between these events, and if we move forward to uh, uh, 1940, which is about 60 years, we find another interesting uh, situation that happens in this very same area. Rustin Parr lived on a mountain near Burkittsville as a hermit. In his early 20s, he built a three-story house in the woods on a hillside next to a creek. He only went into town about twice a year to pick up supplies that he needed. A few years after his self-imposed exile, he began to notice a strange figure, which turned out to be a woman in a long, black, hooded cloak during his walks in the woods. He never saw her face, and she always vanished when he called out to her, or tried to approach. He heard strange noises in the night, scaring him so much he became an insomniac. He came to fear the woman and began to see her and hear her voice in his dreams when he did sleep. Soon, he began to hear her voice during the day as well. At first, he rationalized it as effects of his paranoia and insomnia, but he gradually became more deluded. 
One day in November 1940, the woman ordered him to go into town and take the first group of children he found. Parr abducted the first of what would be eight children from the town over the next six months. He brought the children down in pairs to his basement. He had one stand in the corner while he killed the first child by disemboweling them and carving symbols onto their skin with knives. He would then repeat the same process with the corner child. Each of them had again been disemboweled. There was again reported strange markings of carvings on their hands, on their foreheads, ritualistic carvings, if you will. One night, Parr awoke and saw the cloaked woman in his room. She told him that he was finished, and that she would leave him alone if he went into town the next day and tell everyone what he did. Parr released the last child, Kyle Brody, went into town and declared that he was finally finished. Upon investigation, police found the bodies of seven children in the cellar. Each child had been ritualistically murdered and disemboweled. The event tore the town apart. Parr admitted to everything in detail, telling authorities that he did it for an old woman ghost who occupied the woods near his house. Well, well, Rustin Parr admitted to this crime, and in, in the court he, he said that uh, the reason he killed the children is that he was doing what this old lady ghost had told him to do. Now, it's possible that this man was uh, trying to fit himself into the mythos of the Blair Witch. But that's conjecture. On July 17, 1941, Parr was tried in court on seven counts of first-degree murder. He confessed to all of them, not knowing the names of the children. Parr expressed his apologies to the parents of the deceased and said nothing in his defense, though he agreed with his attorney to plead insanity. Kyle Brody testified that Parr was the one responsible for the killings, and the jury came back with a guilty verdict, resulting in an outbreak of applause in the courtroom. One child, Kyle Brody, would escape from Parr's clutches. He was able to give testimony, and it was his words that decided the fate of the Burkittsville killer. And, ladies and gentlemen, I once again quote Kyle Brody. He told me to stand in the corner and face the wall. I could hear Emily screaming. He was cutting her. I looked. He was cutting a symbol on her face. Sometimes he would come up to me. Do you hear her? Do you hear the woman's voice? I would cry. After a few days, he killed her. He cut her open. And after he took everything out of her, he left with her and I never saw her again. When he came back, he told me not to be sad that he'd bring someone else back soon. Some of the townsfolk, which included some of the parents of the murdered children, went and burned Parr's house to the ground. Rustin Parr was hanged on November 22nd, 1941. And I had a tape one time of a television, of a, of a newsreel, showing him where he was, he was murdered, he was killed for murdering those seven boys. Why did you do it, Mr. Parr? I heard voices in my head. What kind of voices? A woman's. No idea who it was. Was it Mr. Parr? Was it the Blair Witch, Mr. Parr? Could have been. How did he kill the children, Mr. Parr? With knives. Mr. Parr, were you alone in the killings? Yes. Mr. Parr, how did you get the children into the woods? Promised them things. What kind of things, Mr. Parr? Candy. Did you kill other children that we don't know about, Mr. Park? No. Come here, Mr. Park. Mr. Park, why those seven children? That's what the voices told me. Mr. Park, the writings on the wall in your house, they be. Who are the writings on the wall, Mr. Park? Did you write those? Did you write on the wall? No. Who wrote on the wall?
In October 1994, film students Heather Donahue, Michael Williams, and Joshua Leonard set out to produce a documentary about the fabled Blair Witch. Heather Donahue attended Montgomery College, studying filmmaking. Michael Dakota, the film professor, considered her to be one of the best students he'd ever taught. In April of 1994, Heather submitted a proposal to create a documentary on the Burkittsville area legend of the Blair Witch. She intended to tell the story through interviews with Burkittsville natives, local law enforcement officers on the Rustin Parr case, and folklore experts. The heart of the documentary would be a weekend hike into the Black Hills Forest to visit some of the locations associated with the legend. Well, Heather uh, was uh, probably one of the two or three best students that, that, I've, that I've had the pleasure of, of teaching. Um, she was committed. She was energetic. She was very creative. She was someone who I think uh, reminded re me of myself really a lot at, at her age. She was looking to develop and find her, her voice. Joshua Leonard was a film student at Montgomery College who, in April of 1994, was approached by Heather Donahue to be the director of photography for a documentary she was doing. They'd previously worked on several projects together and got along well, so he agreed to the assignment. Joshua was more glitz. Uh, he thought it would be cool to be in, in, the, in the film business. Uh, he was not willing, I don't think, to, to do the kind of work that was really necessary uh, to develop uh, a voice. And, and I think Heather and, and Josh were really sort of polar opposites in, in a lot of ways, but clearly they liked each other. Michael Williams was a student at Montgomery College and became friends with Joshua Leonard, with whom he often went out drinking. Michael enjoyed doing sound recordings, so when his friend Josh asked him to help out on Heather's documentary, he accepted. The trio traveled to Burkittsville, Maryland, formerly Blair, and interview locals about the legend of the Blair Witch. The locals tell them of Rustin Parr, a hermit who kidnapped seven children in the 1940s and brought them to his house in the woods, where he tortured and murdered them. The trio also interviews Mary Brown, a local eccentric who tells them that she had encountered the Blair Witch as a child. The second day, the students began to explore the woods in North Burkittsville to look for evidence of the Blair Witch. The students hiked to Coffin Rock where five men were found ritualistically murdered in the 19th century, and then camped for the night. The next day, they moved deeper into the woods, eventually locating what appears to be an old cemetery with seven small cairns. They set up camp nearby and returned to the cemetery after dark. Josh accidentally disturbs a cairn, and Heather hastily repairs it. Later, they hear crackling sounds in the darkness that seem to be coming from all directions and assume the noises are from animals or locals following them. The following day, they attempt to return to their vehicle, but cannot find their way. They try until nightfall when they are forced to set up camp. That night, they again hear crackling noises, but can't see anything. The next morning, they find three cairns have been built around their tent while they slept. As they continue trying to find their way out of the woods, Heather realizes that her map is missing, and Mike later reveals that he kicked it into a creek out of frustration the previous day. Realizing they are now hopelessly lost, they decide to simply head south. Soon they discover a multitude of humanoid stick figures suspended from trees. That night they hear more strange noises, including the sounds of children. When an unknown force shakes the tent, they flee in a panic and hide in the woods until dawn. Upon returning to their tent, they find that all their possessions have been rifled through, and Josh's equipment is covered with slime. As evening approaches, despite having traveled directly south all day, they again set up camp, completely demoralized at having wasted the entire day, seemingly going in circles. The next morning, Josh has disappeared. After trying in vain to find him, Mike and Heather eventually break camp and slowly move on. That night they hear Josh screaming in the darkness, but are not able to find him. The next morning, Heather finds a bundle of sticks tied with fabric outside their tent. Later inspection reveals it contained blood-soaked scraps of Josh's shirt, as well as teeth and hair. 
but she does not mention this to Mike. That night, Heather films herself apologizing to the co-producers of her project as well as her family, and breaks down crying, terrified that something terrible is hunting them. Later, they again hear Josh's agonized cries for help, but this time they follow them and discover a derelict abandoned house in the woods. Hanging on the front of the house is the same human stick figure they saw in the woods. Mike races upstairs, following the voice, while Heather tries to follow. Mike then claims he hears Josh in the basement. He follows the sound, and after what seems to be a struggle, goes silent and drops to the floor. Heather runs down to the basement screaming for Mike, but gets no answer. She then enters the basement looking for both men, and her camera catches a glimpse of Mike facing the wall in the corner. Heather then screams as she and her camera drop to the floor. There is only silence as the footage ends. The search of the three missing Montgomery College students continues in Frederick County tonight as dozens of volunteers and state officials join local forces in what has now become a full-scale search of the Black Hills area. Local officials, combined with over 100 search volunteers, have failed to come up with any signs of the three missing filmmakers. Montgomery College film students Heather Donahue, Michael Williams, and Joshua Leonard were reportedly shooting a school project about a local myth called the Blair Witch. At this time, their whereabouts are still unknown. The three students disappeared in the Black Hills forest and were never found. After ten days and thousands of man-hours of searching, the only piece of evidence found was Josh's car. Uh, we checked the car over completely, never found any clues with the vehicle. Uh, we checked the, uh, with witnesses that may have seen the FEM students, and never could, we, uh, we can never locate them. The Black Hills search of three missing filmmakers has been called off. Ten days and thousands of man-hours have been unable to produce any clues to the cause of the mysterious disappearances. Family and friends of the Montgomery College graduates are holding on to the hope that someone or something will provide some answers. In October 1995, a University of Maryland anthropology class uncovered the filmmaker's footage buried in sterile soil under the foundation of a colonial-era house. Federal examiners analyzed the footage. So we're, we're working over there, and, and all of a sudden, I, I hear kind of a commotion from the, from the other side of the foundation, and, and, and I hear like rocks banging together. Um, and we kind of ran around the side, and apparently what happened was that Pete was removing a, a stone, and a, a section of the wall just caved in. Nobody was hurt. This was only, this section of the wall by this time was only about four or five feet off the ground. Um, and so I, I checked, and, you know, nobody was injured. I just told him, I said, you know, clear this out a little bit. And about 20 minutes later, Pete comes running up, and he's got a, this dirty old, uh, like, a, a backpack in his hand. By the way they had located those, it appeared that the stones had been there for, for many, many years and uh, had not been disturbed. So it makes you wonder uh, how someone had removed those stones forensically, in other words, stone by stone, carefully uh, not disturbing them and then putting them back in the same exact order that they were originally in the ground. Uh, makes you wonder why they were hiding them there, certainly not for someone to find them because they, they would probably stay there for years and years more if uh, they hadn't have done that anthropology uh, dig. What I recognized real quickly were a couple 16 millimeter film cans. There was also what looked like some videotape uh, cartridges in there. Uh, this had nothing at all to do with colonial period stuff, of course, and so uh, I called the sheriff. Uh, footage was uh, found allegedly that was filmed by the three students. I uh, contacted a local color lab. We got it developed and I reviewed the film and all I found was the students themselves, some scare, scary noises in the woods at night and a few examples of that, but no concrete evidence on what happened to the students. Heather kept a journal during the filming of the Blair Witch Project. It was recovered along with the footage. In addition to original interviews, Curse of the Blair Witch culled footage from several other places, including the Blair Witch Project and Mystic Occurrences, 
a false documentary within a false documentary, supposedly created by Andromeda Productions in 1971. This footage featured Lucan Johnson, a Wiccan who describes the history and tradition of witchcraft and recounts some of the legend of the Blair Witch. My name is Lucan Johnson, and I'm a witch. basically a science. You have a delineation between paganism or polytheistic religions, more than one god, and witchcraft, which is a scientific study of energies and materials. By the power of air, I bless and consecrate thee. From the goddess to the god, so mote it be. Wiccanism is a new religion. Now what you got to understand here, man, is... We lost most of the records for what would be considered witchcraft throughout the latter part of the 17 to 1800s and a lot beforehand with the burning times as we refer to it. Bring out Elizabeth Selwyn. These are when people were tortured and killed, the Salem witch hunts. Simple case of bad bread, the grain in the bread had caused hallucinogenics. You get a bunch of kids hallucinating that someone is making fun of them or torturing them, and of course parents are going to react in a protective manner, and before you know it, people are dying by the hundreds because so-and-so did something evil. <laughs> Most of the time it wasn't anything to do with evil. These were people that were trying to help through either natural lore, herbalism, any kind of medicine that may not have been standard practice. The following people were interviewed for the documentary. Bill Barnes. Bill Barnes is a resident of Burkittsville, Maryland, and is known as the town historian. Bill once had one of the only known copies of the rare book, The Blair Witch Cult, which he believes to be very factual, but it was taken away from him by the Maryland Historical Society. Well, I'm Bill Barnes. I'm the executive director to the Historical Society here in Burkittsville. I've been that quite a few years and known as the town historian. And uh, I've tried to keep up with our history and, and make it be alive to the, to the people that come behind me. Well, it seemed like that, that, uh, that this, this, something happens about every 50 or 60 years to make the Blair Witch Theory continue on. And uh, I think that's probably what the, the cameramen are doing. They were hoping to carry it on in some way, and maybe they did. They may have disappeared, who knows for sure. But uh, it, it's just strange that uh, it always happens almost in, in a 50-year pattern that she somehow surfaces or something surfaces that leads to her. Buck Buchanan. Buck Buchanan is a private investigator. In 1996, he investigated the case of the missing Montgomery College students. I think it's unexplained. I think it remains unexplained what happened to them. In my law enforcement career, I've seen people that have actually decided to disappear on their own and reestablish a new identity. There was no reason in this case for them to do that, and there's no indication that they did. Uh, there's never been any evidence found to show that, they're, that they fell upon foul play, that they're no longer living. Uh, so it's something in between, or, or certainly at the very least, something very suspicious. And I hate to publicly criticize uh, someone in law enforcement. I was in law enforcement for 32 years. I just saw that there were things maybe that could have been done that weren't done. Ronald Cravens. Ronald Cravens was the sheriff of Burkittsville, Maryland from 1992 until roughly 1999. He led the search for Heather, Joshua, and Michael in 1994 after the three filmmakers went missing in the Black Hills Forest. The only piece of evidence found in the 10-day search was Leonard's car. No clues were found in the car and no witnesses were able to provide clues to the location of the film students. The search was called off on November 5, 1994. By June 15, 1995, the case was officially declared cold. 
Uh, Burkersville has only got myself and one deputy. We did the best we could. We called in uh, the county authorities early and we contacted the FBI later for more um, in-depth searching. Michael Dakota. Michael Dakota's film background was in documentaries. In April of 1994, Heather submitted a proposal to create a documentary about the Burkittsville area legend of the Blair Witch. He failed to notice the part of her proposal that outlined a trip into the woods. Because of this, he later harbored some guilt. She had uh, submitted a proposal to me to do a uh, short documentary on uh, the legend of, of Blair Witch. Uh, it was something I had never heard of before, to tell you the truth. Here was uh, a legend that had developed in this area over a course of a couple of centuries. Uh, whenever a particular bad sequence of events happened in this community, there uh, seemed to be uh, a tendency to blame it on uh, Blair Witch, who apparently was a woman who had been cast out during the colonial era uh, as a witch. Um, it seemed like a great opportunity to interview people who had been passing down this legend uh, for, a, for a couple of centuries, really. Dottie Fulcher. Dottie Fulcher was a resident of Burkittsville, Maryland, who helped out the search for the three missing film students in 1994. Dottie was a very spiritual woman who believed that Ellie Kedward still inhabited the Black Hills area and chooses times to appear to people. When Heather, Josh, and Michael went missing in the Black Hills forest in October of 1994, Dottie joined the search party, which came up empty. The search was called off ten days later, and she tried unsuccessfully to convince Sheriff Cravens that there were still clues out there and they should keep looking. She feels that the police saw the Blair Witch in their search and don't want to talk about it. Dottie still goes out looking for the filmmakers from time to time. Well, when the, the story turned into a really big story, I went to the sheriff's office and I tried to talk with him, and he's really been no help. I mean, it's... Um, I joined the search party and I called when we didn't find anything on the search party and I told him I thought we should still keep looking because I, I know there are clues out there. You know, I still go out and I still look and I know there's something out there. Um, he's talked to me a few times, but I, he just doesn't, he doesn't want to hear anything I have to say. That's why there's this feeling that I have that they know more than they're willing to talk about. I think they don't want to admit that they saw her and that she's there. You know, Ellie is not very far from any of us at any time, and she chooses her time to, to appear. And um, they just don't want to acknowledge that. David Mercer. David Mercer was an anthropology professor at the University of Maryland in the mid-1990s. While performing an archaeological dig in October of 1995 on the foundation of a colonial-era house, one of Mercer's students, Peter Gould, discovered a dirty old backpack underneath the sterile, undisturbed soil of the house. Inside the bag, they found some film cans, dat tapes, video cassettes, a Hi8 camera, a journal, and a CP16 film camera. It was later determined that the equipment had belonged to the filmmakers who had gone missing a year earlier. Mercer was interviewed in 1999 and stated that there is no scientific explanation for how the backpack was buried. This uh, backpack was found in, in a sterile soil, which is like the bottom of the site. It's just, you know, from there to the middle of the earth is just dirt. Uh, the original house at the site had burned down, and so there was a layer of ash that was like sitting in, in the interior of the house, like the basement. So this, this knapsack had been in sterile soil uh, with no evidence around it of disturbance. Along, over the top of it was an undisturbed layer of ash, and the whole thing was boxed in by uh, a, uh, basically a colonial era wall uh, that was undisturbed. Uh, it was. It, 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 uh, even a forensic expert could not have put that thing into the site without disturbing the charcoal, the wall, or the sterile soil. Um, it was as if it materialized. And, and of course, that's not the language of science, so I can't, I, I just don't know what to say about this, really. At the time that the footage was found, it was, it was scary. It was very, very eerie. 
Um, and it's not something that I really want to look at. To tell you the truth, I, I, I've kind of avoided it. Um, I really don't, I don't feel too comfortable with seeing the last few days of my brother's life on, on video. I really just don't feel too comfortable with that. It's, it's very eerie. Well, when, when they found this videotape or film or recordings of whatever it was, uh, immediately the, the Blair Witch business emerged and people became superstitious and they said, well, maybe this is connected to the Blair Witch. Well, I, I thought it was kind of fishy myself. I looked at the whole thing as possibly a hoax or whatever, but, but it was still strange. After reviewing the film, I still thought it was a hoax. Well, it's always that possibility, but um, I, I think, like I mentioned earlier, I think it would be remote that it's a hoax because of the way the tapes were hidden and uh, the, the fact that it, just to view the tapes, they are very realistic and they do, the tape is from a time period that the students would have been able to tape it. Well, it seemed like that, that, uh, that this, this, this something happens about every 50 or 60 years to make the Blair Witch Theory continue on. And uh, I think that's probably what the, the cameramen are doing. They were hoping to carry it on in some way, and maybe they did. They may have disappeared, who knows for sure. But uh, it, it's just strange that uh, it always happens almost in, in a 50-year pattern that she somehow surfaces or something surfaces that leads to her. I think they knew the legend, but I don't think they knew the whole history. I don't think they felt um, any fear, but I don't think they felt any kind of respect. I think to them it was just another project. Uh, it was a way to get a grade, and um, I think they met her, and I think she met them when she was ready to, and I think they're gone. The case of the Black Hills disappearances has once again been closed. The investigation was reopened last October after film reels and video cassettes supposedly belonging to the three missing film students were found by a Maryland University anthropology class. Frederick County police officials declared today that the found footage was inconclusive and that all possible leads on the case have been exhausted. Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard, and Michael Williams disappeared in 1994 while shooting a documentary film project in the Black Hills area near Burkittsville. The three student filmmakers are still missing. Now, whenever I watch the Blair Witch Project, I always start my viewing with Curse of the Blair Witch. Truth be told, I frequently watch it all by itself. It is as brilliantly well made as the feature and just as compelling. Unlike the website which has fallen victim to time, the documentary is still available, and I highly recommend you see it. I have been obsessed with it for years. Thank you for listening to Eclectic Obsessions. If you like what you've heard, please download past episodes and subscribe on iTunes for future releases. You can follow the show on Facebook at Eclectic Obsessions on Twitter at Eclectic Obsess One, on Instagram at Eclectic Obsessions Podcast, and on YouTube at Eclectic Obsessions. I'd love to hear what you think. Feel free to email the show at ecobpod at gmail.com. We'll be back in one month's time with a new Eclectic Obsession. <laughs>